Today, on an all-new Dr. Phil, at 10, he killed his own father. You put a gun to his head and you pulled the trigger. I was forced to do it. His stepmother was convicted. She recruited you to do this. If you said no, what happened? She would torture me, burn me with the lighter. Where was his birth mother? I really thought he was going to have a good childhood. I had no childhood. You just tortured me for years. How could you turn a child over to her? Some say blood runs thicker than water, but unfortunately that is not always the case. My first guest was only 10 years old when he took a gun into his father's room and shot him point blank in the head while he was asleep. He says years of abuse led up to the killing, not from his dad, but from his stepmother. Take a look. I was 10 years old when I shot my father to death. My father remarried to Judith when I was five or six years old. I was abused and tortured nearly every day by Judith. Judith would spank me, beat me, throw me around. She also would make me eat feces. When there were bruises on me, she would make me lay in a bathtub with ice water for hours to bring down the swelling. When I would try to get out of it, she would easily hold my head under the water. My teachers would sometimes see bruises on my arms and around my neck, and Judith would make me wear long sleeves and turtlenecks in the middle of summer. That's why she began abusing my genitals. Judith would burn me with the lighter on my genital area. She would twist and pull. Judith had convinced my father that I was a problem child. She would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, go grab a cup of water and throw it on your dad. I couldn't tell her no, I would just be beaten more. I was completely brainwashed by Judith. I had to do everything she said, including killing my father. Well, I know it is hard to wrap your mind around this, but Corey says killing his father wasn't an accident. In fact, it was a carefully thought out plan. Judith had planned my dad's death for a couple weeks. Judith told me my dad was dying of brain cancer. She just said it was his idea that I was supposed to shoot him and it would be ruled an accidental death. November 3rd, 2003. I got off the school bus and as we were walking to the house, she put her hand around my neck and told me this was the day. The gun was in the laundry room and I was to grab it and go where he was sleeping. There were some catalogs and stuff I was supposed to put over the floor and the bed to make it look like we were explaining and talking about hunting and I was supposed to put it up to his head and pull the trigger. So I went into the bedroom and I did as I was told. My father was asleep. I laid out the magazines by myself and pulled the trigger. I shot him in the head. When I shot him, I remember hearing this one last breath that he took and it was just long and drawn out and I knew he was gone. As soon as it happened, I, I dropped the gun and I ran to the phone and called 911. Judith made sure that she was at her mother's house. I had Judith's story memorized so I knew exactly what to say. I told the police that I was handing my dad the gun. He had grabbed it and kind of jerked it and my finger was on the trigger and it went off. The police believed me. For the next nine years, I had to keep that secret. All right, Corey, uh, I I'm glad to meet you, but I'm sorry for the circumstances. And everybody that's watching this right now is saying, you know, wait a minute, what? Y you went in to your father's room where he was lying asleep, and you put a gun to his head, and you pulled the trigger, and you did it on purpose? Yes. All right. And what kind of gun are we talking about here? Um, it was a four-cent shotgun. So you put a shotgun to his head. He's asleep. Did, did you love your father? Did you hate your father? Uh, I loved him. I mean, it wasn't my doing. I was told and forced to do it. I really had no choice. All right. Now, what were you told ab about brain cancer and a tumor. What were you told about that? Uh, Judith had told me that 
my dad uh, was dying of brain cancer and he had a brain tumor and then it was his actually his idea to be shot so the family would be well off from the life insurance right and so Judith we're talking here about your stepmother she collected a half a million dollars yes okay now here's what everybody is is thinking is how do you talk a child into walking into the bedroom putting a gun to the head of their father and pulling the trigger when it's a father that he loves cares about admires looks up to in so many ways um, but the the truth here is that this came on the heels of relentless coercion and torture and punishment at the hands of this woman with no hope for escape and this is something that didn't happen occasionally this was relentless across what period of time yes it actually lasted up till I was 18 and moved out if you did resist if you said no what happened um, you know she would several times she told me that she would kill me but I mean she would just torture me that much more when she came up with this plan and said we have to kill your father what did you say when she first brought that up to you I had no choice I mean I wasn't allowed to you know, say no or anything I just had to do it take me through the moment that she first mentioned this to you what did she say to you where were you um, we were at the house and she told me that uh, I had wanted to get, learn how to go hunting so my dad was going to teach me and she brought it up to him and so he started showing me about the gun and everything just you know hiding her tracks so it was said that I did want to learn how to hunt and stuff right and then the day she came and told you about the plan what did she say um, she told me I was to walk into his bedroom and or walk into Emily's bedroom where he was sleeping and put the gun up to his head after I would spread out some catalogs and hunting stuff and pull the trigger what was your first reaction I mean I don't know I was totally under her control she told me that if I didn't uh, I would be the one that was dead All right. you kept this secret for 10 years I did. You, you didn't tell anybody what really happened for 10 years correct um, what was that like living with that for 10 years I don't know I mean everyone that knew me in school I just I, I felt like they didn't know me I was I, I faked my entire life you know I had to make up stories of my life because it wasn't happy at home but everyone thought it was later in court when all of this came out your stepmother said that they were sending you to military school in fact she said we were sending Corey to military school and Corey did not want to go and he shot his father purposely and made up this whole story what did you think when you heard her say that she's delusional she just once again trying to get out of it up next why Corey says his father would still be alive if it weren't for my next guest and it's not Judith. Corey's father married Judith about two years after we got divorced. When I was eight years old, my mother signed all of her rights over to my father. I thought it would be better for him to have a stable environment instead of going back and forth and the fighting. I had no idea Corey was being abused by Judith. Tomorrow on Dr. Phil. Both of you cheated in the marriage. Both of you lied in the marriage. It's a battle of the exes. The only way anything's going to work is if we're honest. Well, that ship has sailed. Everyone's taking sides. My mother showed up to court on my ex-wife's behalf. And dropping bombshells. We talked about you visiting or coming by. You moved to Florida and didn't tell me. Are any of y'all on medication? America's most watched talk show. That's tomorrow.
Judith Hockey was indicted for aggravated murder, but she's not the one who pulled the trigger, killing her ex-husband. She's charged with causing an irresponsible person to commit the murder, that person being the victim's son, who was just 10 years old at the time. After I shot my father, I was in the ambulance. Judith came in and she put her arm around my neck. She came right up to my ear and said, don't mess this up, stick to the story. She was afraid that I would tell the truth. Corey says he didn't tell anyone about killing his father for nine years. He said he was too scared of what would happen to him if he did. Eventually, Corey confided to teachers at school. That started a process. An investigation was started. Did you think you were going to go to jail? Um, yes. The next day I was interviewed at school after I talked to her and, you know, after I told them, I asked them when I was going to go to jail and they just looked at me and said I wasn't. They said you weren't. What did you think at that moment when they said you're not going to jail? I don't know. I guess I was shocked because <clears> I kind of <throat> figured after I brought this out, I would, but I didn't care. I just wanted Judith to be held responsible. When you finally gave it a voice, how did you feel? It was just weight off my shoulders. It's kind of hard to explain. Just instant happiness in a way. Now, this happened when you were 10 years old. Yes, sir. You stayed with her for how many more years? Until I was 18, so eight. So eight more years. The abuse, you say it improved. I mean, it was a little less. Um, in frequency, but the intensity was still there. Yeah. I mean, she, this continued on for the next eight years. Yeah, until I, the day I moved out. Until you moved out. And by this point, she thinks she's gotten away with it. Yes. She recruited you to do this. She thinks she's done, but a trial ensues. She is convicted. Now, Corey's stepmother was sentenced to life in prison without parole just this last December. However, Corey says there's another person he also holds responsible for his father's death. Take a look. I blame my biological mother, Wendy, for everything that's happened to me and my dad. Corey was about three when his father and I got divorced. Corey's father married Judith about two years after we got divorced. I would see my mother every other weekend up to the age of eight. After his father got remarried to Judith, I didn't really get to see Corey much. There would be weeks or a month or so where I wasn't allowed to see him. When I was eight years old, my mother signed all of her rights over to my father. I thought it would be better for him to have a stable environment instead of going back and forth and the fighting. I had no idea Corey was being abused by Judith. The day I was adopted, we went to Walmart to meet up with Wendy. I didn't get a chance to talk to her. I stayed in the car, but when Judith came back out, Judith said that my biological mom wanted nothing to do with me. I remember wanting to cry, but not being able to. My whole life just kind of stood still right then and there. At the time, I thought I was doing the best thing for Coy. If Wendy wouldn't have given me up, my dad would still be alive, and I want Wendy to answer for what she did. Okay, how do you feel about what he just said? I feel hurt um, that he blames me for his father being dead. I don't quite understand why he blames me. What is it that you blame her for? For signing and, and, and just be completely honest. This is the time to get it out. For signing your own your own <laughs> son over and not giving a damn about him or what happened to him. And you say, but for her doing that, your father would be alive today. If she hadn't signed you away and turned you over to this monster, that monster wouldn't have taken control of you as a child and caused you to kill your father. Right. So you say, if there's a links in the chain, that her signing you over to this monster was the first link. Yes. What do you say to that? I didn't know any of the abuse was going on. I didn't know Judith was going to abuse him. I mean, they were after we got divorced and he, his dad remarried her, I had to deal with her to see Corey. 
And there would go lengths where I wasn't allowed to get him. And the fighting with her and the back and forth and going to pick him up. And she would yank him out of my car. And I just thought it would be best if I signed my rights off. But it wasn't because I didn't want him in my life. I just wanted him to be happy and have a stable life. So you gave me up so you didn't have to fight. I'm going to let Wendy answer that when we come back. My kids, they'll never have a grandpa because of me. You know how I'm going to have to explain that? My dad's not here, and I hate her for it. So you gave me up so you didn't have to fight. I didn't know how to fight. I didn't have the money I would write the judge a letter saying they're not letting me see him. He would say, get a lawyer. I didn't have the money. But there's a difference between not having the money to fight and signing away your parental rights to this child. And I mean, that's what a lot of mothers in America right now are sitting there thinking, you know, you may have to rage against the machine. You may have to fight the court system. You may have to do whatever you can but you don't have to sign away your rights where you don't even have the ability to intervene on his behalf if in fact something goes wrong. You're right. I'm not trying to defend it and I'm sorry, but I really thought at the time it was the best thing to do. For you or for him? For both of us. Because I think your dad was hurt because I cheated on him and he used you as a pawn to hurt me. Why would you cheat on my dad? Why didn't you just stay with him? What was I don't wrong? know why I cheated on him, Corey. I was young, and I made a mistake. And I'm sorry. If you were sorry, you'd have never signed me over. I'm sorry. You're sorry for what? I'm so sorry for signing him away. I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. Why won't you look at him when you say that? You look everywhere in the room but at your son. I'm sorry. I've tried to tell him this over and over again. I'm so sorry. Do you think I'm sorry? My dad's not here because of me. Because Judas tortured me and abused me for years because of you giving me up. How do you think I feel? I'm sorry. Corey, I am really sorry. Answer the question. How do you think he feels? Hurt and angry. You know, my kids, my kids, they'll never have a grandpa because of me. You know how I'm going to have to explain that? And then, you know, while I'm explaining that, I'm going to go ahead and include it's because you decided it would make your life easier if I wasn't around and you didn't have to fight for me. So you're afraid that someday you grow up, get married, and your children say, where's grandpa? Well, I shot him in the head. I mean, that's a tough story to tell, right? Yeah. And, well, where's grandma? Well, she actually terminated her parental rights, so I don't really have a mother legally. I do genetically, but not legally. And my stepmother, well, she's in prison for the rest of her life. It gets to be a... It gets to be a sad and complex story, is your point, and you're left to live with all that. Um, how do you feel towards her? What are your feelings? I mean, it's, it's hate. That's, that's what it is. I, my dad's not here, and I hate her for it. Is that what you thought? Yeah, I already knew that he hated me. I do feel it. She's running you out, right? I mean, she's yanking him out of your car. She's giving you hell. If she's intimidating you, a grown woman, how could you turn a child over to her? And once you sign away your rights, you don't even have, you can't even ask questions. Because his thinking in part is if he had even gotten to see you once a month, in one of those times, he could have said, I need to tell you what's going on here. 
I got the scars to prove it. This isn't just some, gee, I don't want to live with him anymore. I got the scars to prove it. It's a little embarrassing here, Mom, but take a look at this. Um, he, he could have said something where you could have called the authorities. Anything could have happened. I mean, that's his, he's playing the what if game. You get that? Yeah. He's saying, what if you hadn't, and I'd been able to tell you, and you were able as an adult to get me help because I'm 10 years old, I can't do it. You, you understand? I understand. All right, let's take a break. With Judith in jail and his dad deceased, Wendy says she's the only one left to blame. Well, we'll hear why she feels it's unfair when we come back. Corey should blame me for the death of his father. I think Corey should be more angry with Judith. She took his father away from me, his childhood away from me. Corey told me that he told his father about the abuse from Judith. I'm angry that his father didn't do anything about it. His dad is gone, Judith is in prison, so who else does he have to be mad at? But I don't think it's fair. Well, that was Wendy who says she's the only one left in her son's life to blame for the death of his father. She maintains that at the time she gave custody of Corey to his father and stepmother that she truly believed that it was in his best interest. She says she had no idea about the horrific abuse that he was enduring and was to endure in his life. Well, what you told us is I really don't know everything that took place that I heard some things in the sentencing true and just that little bit other than that is kind of all I know I've never really gotten in and learned what my son lived for all of these years that's true I wrote down something you said that I thought was very important you said I haven't asked because I don't want to make it worse again for you or for him for both. I don't want to push him away and have him hate me more than he already does. But I tried to hug you at the trial and talk to you there and you didn't want anything to do with me. Do you think I should have anything to do with you? I hope someday. That's you hope someday I have something to do with you. I'm, I want you to have something to do with me. Do you think you deserve it? I don't know. Maybe I don't. What do you want from her? I don't know. At this point, friendship, to say the least. I, don't, <clears throat> I honestly don't think that I can call you mom. In my opinion, a mom never, never gives up their child, no matter the circumstances. I know if I had a son or a daughter, I'd never give them up. But she did. And that was then, and this is now. And my question is, um, do you want to spend the rest of your life hating her? Do you want to spend the rest of your life bashing her? Do you want to spend the rest of your life blaming her? And if not, what do you want? No, I don't want to do that, but like I said, friendship. It's a little hard to be friends with somebody that starts every exchange from, from a point of view of, I hate you. I hate you. I understand. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that makes it very difficult. What is it you need to hear from her. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, we've we interviewed you at length, and he had a good question. Why did you keep his sister, but not him? All my sisters. To be honest, I don't know why. I really thought at the time I signed those papers, I, I didn't. Judith wasn't 
the nicest person, but I had no idea she was capable of abusing him or not being a good mom to him. I thought she was going to be a better mom to him than I could be. And his father and her were going to raise him and he was going to have a good childhood. I had no idea anything like this could happen. I had no childhood. Just letting you know, that, that part of my life, as soon as you handed me over, that was gone. I'm sorry. Well, the question is, can Corey learn to forgive his mother? Should he forgive his mother? I'll let you know what I think about this when we come back. Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. A teenage girl is stabbed to death, and the two people charged are her two best friends. They stood over her body and watched her die. Why would they commit this shocking crime? Sheila isn't a sociopath. She killed my daughter. She's just all smiles the day after the murder. Exclusive interviews. Tell us what you read in her diary about the night of the murder. And secret tapes. The really big information that I'm hearing is... That's Monday. My ex-husband, Robert, did let Judith control my visits with Corey. When I would come and pick Corey up, put him in my car, she would come and open the door. When she yanked him out of the car, I didn't want to cause a scene, so I would just leave. I wouldn't have that visit with him. Judith did make me feel powerless. I, I want to sp spend a few minutes talking to you about this. Um, and there's no way that I can make sense out of this because you can't make sense out of nonsense and what happened to you is nonsensical, it's illogical, it's wrong at every level and so there's nothing that I can say or she can say or anybody can say that's going to make any of that okay. Nobody can give you back those years Nobody can take away the pain and the hurt and the fear and the suffering and now the guilt you, you feel about what you did. And, and I'm telling you, your goal has got to be to A, forgive yourself. Because I know you have conversations with yourself about how could I do that? I mean, how could I not say no why didn't i run away why didn't i shoot her why didn't i you know i don't know you, you, you play this this what if game with yourself it can make you absolutely crazy and you do that do you not i do and every time you do you wind up on the short end because you beat the hell out of yourself don't you i do and you don't deserve that you absolutely don't deserve that. You were a victim here. She victimized you. She victimized your father. She victimized your mother. She victimized everybody. And if she's allowed to continue this fracture in this family, then evil wins. Evil wins. And you have never, maybe never heard it, but... <clears throat> There is a truth, I believe, that says the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And if you do nothing, if you just stay paralyzed and frozen, she wins. You have got to set a goal and say, I am going to sort this out and I am going to forgive myself. And believe me, that's a choice. And when you do that then you'll find it in your heart to forgive her. You, you, I tell you, the older you get, the more you learn that life is about intentions. And your mother made some really bad choices at the time. Had she come to me at that time, I would have counseled her to the contrary. I would say, don't you ever, ever burn that bridge. Don't you ever shut off your right to intervene. This is your child. But she didn't have that access at the time. She made a bad decision with good intention. And fair? Yes. Bad decision, good intention. Very bad decision. And my point 
that I want you to understand is forgiving her does not mean what she did was okay. It just means I choose to not be locked in that bond of bitterness with you for the rest of my life. And will you have a relationship with her? You know, I don't know. Relationships are not genetic. They're based on experience. A, a mother that hasn't been in a child's life for 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it is, they come back together. There's just not this natural bond. You have to build that. It's based on shared experiences, and you're not there yet. But I want to get you some help with this. I want to get you some professional help to sit down with you and help you think your way out of this maze. You said how free you felt when you told and you got it off your shoulders. Well, there's a weight on your other shoulder right now. And it's this guilt and anger and bitterness. And I want to help get that off your shoulder too. And then, then there's a chance to begin to build this with boundaries. If I arrange that help for you, will you take it? I would. Okay. And you'll participate when it's time, right? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Coming up, my next guest says that she's been stabbed in the back by her own flesh and blood. She blames her sister for the fact she lost custody of her six-month-old baby. Her sister says, look, don't blame me. Blame your own bad parenting. We'll be right back. My sister Tashina stabbed me in the back. My sister thinks that I called the Department of Children and Families on her. My sister dramatized the truth. I have no problem taking custody of my niece if that's what I have to do to protect her. Hey, Dr. Phil here. Did you know that more than 16 million kids in the U.S. are at risk of hunger each day? That's more than one in five children. Now, these are our neighbors, our kids that play in the neighborhood, co-workers, friends' children. The problem is closer than you would think, but so is the solution. Join me and visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger to find your local food bank to help. I'm Dr. Phil, and together, we are Feeding America. We can't do this show without you, our studio audience. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Because we have a lot of fun here, don't we? Yeah! Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. Today's guests are talking about the fact that they've been betrayed by those that should love them the most. My next guest claims her sister is to blame for her losing custody of her six-month-old daughter. My sister Tashina stabbed me in the back. My sister thinks that I called the Department of Children and Families on her. DCF took custody of her baby. My daughter was born with a hole in her diaphragm, and she was on life support machines after she was born. I still am terrified that my daughter could die. While Michelle's daughter was in the hospital, Michelle had bragged to me that she smoked pot on the roof of the hospital. Somebody called DCF on us and said that my daughter's father and I smoke weed around our daughter and that we physically fight around her. Michelle and the baby's father got in a physical altercation where he went to headbutt Michelle and Michelle hit him. When I had a meeting with the Department of Children and Families, my sister sat at the table and dramatized the truth. She has filled their heads with lies. I have no problem taking custody of my niece if that's what I have to do to protect her. Well, Michelle says when she did have custody of her baby, Tashina would constantly undermine her, making matters worse. My sister is trying to sabotage me as a parent. I gave my sister a lot of advice, and she would just claim I was criticizing her. My sister would always hold my daughter and say, my baby, my baby. And at first, I thought I was harmless, but... As it kept happening, I'd be like, can I, can I see my daughter? 
like try and get her back and she'd be like, no, my baby. My sister was not putting 100% into parenting. I mean, maybe 50%. I would put my daughter down for a nap and my sister would go and wake her up because she wanted to hold her. She'd say, I just want to get my baby fixed. She was only a few months old, so I felt like she should not be alone in a crib, awake. I would dress my daughter up for the day, and then I would turn around 10 minutes later, and my sister would have changed her outfit. I would never change my niece's clothes unless she spit up on it. It happened all the time. I felt like I couldn't even dress my own daughter. I feel I am more attached to my niece than my sister is. She's crossing the line. Do you have custody of your baby right now? No. Who does have custody? Um, DCF. DCF has cu yeah. custody of the baby. It's it, it's with a, a a medical foster home, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Why is she not with you? Um, <clears throat> the you say it's because of her. But no, I don't think it's because of her. I think she played a big part in it. I don't think she's the one that called DCF. I think she played part in the person who called DCF. But they took her because. Um, I didn't have a stable home for her to live and because she had missed appointments, which I take responsibility for it because I relied on other people for rides. Okay, and you want this child back? Yes, I've been doing everything to get her back. Really? Yeah. And here's a checklist that she needs to fulfill in order to do so. She has to get a driver's license. She has to have a car and transportation. Do you have that? Not yet, no. no. Okay, so you don't have a driver's license, you don't have a car. You have to have a job. Yes, I'm looking. Do, do you have a job? No. No. Okay. You have to get some type of college. Yeah, and I was going to apply this week, but I came here for this. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have that? Nope. You don't, you're not involved? No, I just point. got no. the list of things. A okay. Week ago. Social Security card? I had an appointment to do that this week, but I came here. <laughs> So it was all going to happen this week? Not everything. I mean, the okay. license, that's so not going to happen card, fast. You don't have stable living environment? Looking for an apartment right now with my boyfriend. With your boyfriend? Yeah. But you don't have a place? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, birth control? Yeah, I did that. I went to the doctors because that was one of the things on my list to do, and I got <clears> that all set up. Okay. And mandatory counseling that you're supposed I, to participate yeah, I'm in? I'm in that. You've been inconsistent about yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's Let's hard just cut to the chase. No transportation uh, is the right. hardest part. Well, for whatever reason. You know, you say that you really want this baby back, but I, I can tell you as someone that's been involved in mm -hmm. these things a number of times, I never listen to what people say. Mm -hmm. I just look at what they do. And you're here blaming your sister, I'm saying she's a big her. part of this. Well, no, that's not true. You, you said she's trying to take your baby, she's being inappropriately involved with your yes. baby, that um, you think she called CPS no, or I do not. turned you in? No. Well, I'm glad somebody called. Aren't you? No. You my missed 12 my... appointments in a row for uh, your baby, yes, and, and your baby my, is and not well. My fault. Because I relied, on, I relied on other people for rides, and they didn't fall through. And That's after, not true. Yes, that it is. is not and, even close to true. a lot of the time... I brought my daughter to the ER and we'd be there until 4 in the morning and she'd have an appointment at 11. We'd go home and it, I'd have to reschedule. And I, I take full responsibility for missing my daughter's appointments. And once that had happened, I set it up so that I would get transportation through my insurance. So once I get her back, she will never miss an appointment again. Well, you, you don't sound like you take full responsibility because you say you were relying on other people for rides. I did. And they didn't show up. Yes, that but, sounds like you're blaming as, people that no, didn't show up. No, because as my daughter's mother, it's my <clears throat> responsibility to get her rides. And it was my, I was wrong for relying on other people for that. Well, Michelle claims that she stopped smoking uh, marijuana and that she just stopped smoking. Uh, we're going to find out the truth about all that when we come back. My sister has a history of lying. When we were younger, one of my dresses went missing. A week later, Michelle was wearing it. I confronted Michelle, and she looked me straight in the eye and said, this is not your dress. It looks exactly like it, but it's my friend's. The dress was mine. I never stole a dress from my sister. I mean, I might have borrowed a dress, but not the one she's talking about. It's very hard to trust anything my sister says. Want to know what's coming up on Dr. Phil? Visit our website and subscribe to our email newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and 
exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on drphil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. Now, Michelle says she feels like everyone is kind of scheming against her, and she's doing the best she can. Take a look. My sister has many times put her own needs before her daughter's. My sister stopped smoking pot after she was at least three months pregnant. Before I got pregnant, I used to party sometimes, and I did smoke weed. As soon as I found out that I was pregnant, I stopped smoking when Michelle's daughter was born, we expected her to have a lot of problems. I fundraised $1,800 for Michelle. It was gone in three weeks. She says that she spent the money on food, but that's a lot of money on food. She makes it seem like I went and like partied with it all, but I was going to class every day an hour and a half away. That's a lot of gas to go back and forth. I believe Michelle spent some of the money on pot. Did you spend any of it on dope? No. There are people in this world, in different agencies, Department of Child and Family Services or whatever, that regard themselves as fiduciaries. You know what a fiduciary is? Mm -hmm. A fiduciary is someone that is required by law to put someone else's interest ahead of their own. And you can say what you want to say, but here's what we know. Yeah. You missed 12 doctor's appointments, don't care why. Uh, you failed to get blood work done in the first trimester, don't care why. Then the baby is born and does have problems. Yeah, well, we knew she would. They didn't even think she'd live. spends lived. months in the hospital. Mm -hmm, and I was there with her the whole time. If I wasn't a good mom, I would have been like, oh, this is a vacation, and I would have left, and so I would have never been there. Weeks at a time. No, I wasn't. Okay. That's why it cost so much gas to go back and forth, because we hated being away from her. Okay, based on, let me tell you, I, I'm not telling you that you don't love your baby. <laughs> I'm telling you that being a parent is a privilege. Yes. And it is a privilege that you earn by conducting yourself responsibly. And that means responsibly on providing this child care, whether medical care, housing, food, safety, and I, and whatever. And I haven't been able to do that, and, and that's why I don't have and, and despite everything that you say, based on history, you have not done that yet. And so you, you are not ready to have that child back. I mean, I'm working on all those things. So. Well, you've got the list, and we yeah. do too. I'm just saying. All right. Thanks to all my guests today, and a special thanks to our medical team at Doctor on Demand for assisting some of my team in preparation for the show. If you at home want to have your own Doctor on Demand, a new app we created, go to Google Play or the App Store and download Doctor on Demand app. I hope you guys hear what I'm saying here. It seems to me she's trying to help you, not hurt you, but you decide that on your own. Thanks for being here. So long. Yay.